Hello, everyone. I'm glad you can join us this evening. So welcome to our, our next event. So this is part of our Decade of Commemorations programme, which is supported by Peace4 and SEPUB. That's a bit of a mouthful, but they're the ones that are supporting our exhibitions and all of our engagement programmes. So we're very grateful for all of their support. I think we have quite a few of you watching this evening, so I'm really glad. It's a lovely evening here in the Northwest, so I'm hoping it's a lovely evening for you too. My name is Bernadette Walsh, and I am the archivist at the Tower Museum. And in collaboration with the Nerve Centre, Paula, John and David, we are delighted to bring you this event this evening. We've been very excited for this event. Our exhibition is called Dividing Island, and it opened in the Tower Museum in July. It's actually closed at the moment because of COVID-19 restrictions, but the exhibition will run until February. So I'm sure it will be open and you will have a chance to call into us again. It's part of our annual exhibition programme. And this is the last exhibition in our Decade of Commemorations programme with the Nerve Centre. So far we've covered um, First World War, conscription, uh, 1916, and now we're looking at uh, the period 1920 to 1922. The exhibition looks at the legacy, the origins, the impact and the legacy of the partition of Ireland. And why the exhibition is closed, this is a great opportunity for you to have a look at our website. So our website is towermuseumcollections.com and we have lots of really great images of the collection. We've got videos and we've got links to all of the other events in this programme. So get it, if you get a chance, have a look at the exhibition and all of our contact details are there as well if you've got any questions about future events. So this evening we have acclaimed historian, Dem Ferreter, and he is going to have a conversation with author Garrett Carr this evening. So Dem, as many of you will know, he is a regular television and radio broadcaster and writer. He's professor of modern Irish history at UCD and his books include The Transformation of Ireland, 1900 to 2000, Judging Dev, a Reassessment of the Life and Legacy of Eamon de Valera, which is an excellent book for the archive sources, if anyone is interested in accessing archive sources. It's a hugely great resource. Most recently, The Border and The Weight of a Century of Anglo-Irish Relations, Garrett is our lecturer in creative writing at Queen's University and author of another great book, Rule of the Land, Walking Island's Border, which was a BBC Radio 4 book of the week. He has also created a varied collection of maps of Ireland's border regions, which have been exhibited very widely. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to pass you over to Garrett and to Dermot. And just a few little, for those of you that are not familiar with, with these online, webinars, if you can switch to gallery view, then you'll be able to see the participants. I'm gonna log out and you should be able to see Garrett and Dermot and you'll be able to see the Nerve Center logo. If you have any technical issues, they'll be able to sort you out. So once again, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Get in touch with us, put in comments and even after the event, if you've got any questions about the exhibition Dividing Island or about our engagement program do feel free to contact us once again. Thank you very much. You can see me now. Thank you, everybody, for being here this evening. According to my little readout, we've got 148 people, which is uh, which is great. I'm very glad to have you all here. So uh, I'm talking to Dermot Ferreter tonight, the historian, uh, and we're talking about the border, which is the subject of Dermot's last book, just published last year. And the first thing I want to ask you, Dermot, is not really a fair question, to be honest. Um, it's perhaps almost more a philosophical one, because I had an interview recently with a, a dairy writer called Darren Anderson, who's just recently published a, a memoir about dairy called Inventory, but it's very good. And we we're talking about the border, and he, the way he spoke of the border was as was this freakish occurrence from a set of weird coincidences that it kind of came together, uh, and it was a very unlikely sort of event. Whereas my way of looking at things is that everything since the Norman invasion points to the border. And Erin leads, you'd have to go back to the Norman invasion if you wanted to find the step off point to get us off this timeline. 
What do you think? Was the border inevitable? No, it wasn't inevitable. Um, I think the interesting thing uh, about that conversation you had um, in in relation to the you know the bigger question, um, I think what's most interesting is that it wasn't being spoken about the partition of Ireland or the creation of a border um, until really a couple of years before it happened. Um, there were no vocal or robust demands for a border on the island of Ireland um, until seven or eight years before it became a reality. And that's that's a relatively short space of time, you know. So uh, I think we've got to think um, about those who ultimately ended up with a border to safeguard their interests, uh, they being those who wanted to remain in the United Kingdom and couldn't tr- have any truck of the idea of a, a 32 county a home rule Ireland. I think you've got to think about them uh, and how they saw themselves and how they saw their, their mission as unionists. We've got to distinguish between Irish unionism and Ulster unionism. Um, and even, you know, the iconic um, leader who leads the campaign against the third uh, Home Rule Bill, which is the first time Home Rule is, looks uh, to be likely, he's a Dubliner. You know, Edward Carson saw himself as an Irish unionist. Um, and even before him, if you look at the kind of landed leadership of, of unionism in the late 19th uh, and early 20th century, people like Edward Saunderson, they too saw themselves as Irish unionists. They didn't see themselves as Ulster unionists. Um, but if you have a look then at posters that were being used by James Craig uh, a couple of decades later, uh, for electoral purposes, the message is Ulster. We're Ulster. We're Ulster unionists. We're not Irish unionists. So that would suggest that uh, the creation of Northern Ireland is, is something of a compromise uh, for, for unionists also, in the sense that their political mission um, is to keep the whole of the island uh, within the United Kingdom. Uh, and they end up, of course, with this solution, uh, which was supposed to be a temporary solution. So I think when you look at it like that, it's perhaps not that surprising um, that there wasn't anything inevitable about this. Uh, obviously, there was a difficulty in, in coming to any kind of an accommodation uh, with nationalists, and nationalists had their own responsibilities uh, in relation to that. Uh, but I do think right up to very late in his career, Edward Carson was still holding out hope that there might be a solution um, that would avoid the partition of Ireland. Because I think even some of those who consider themselves Irish unionists considered the division of Ireland to be a great tragedy. You know, there's an extraordinary moment in the Theatre Royal in 1913 when Andrew Bonner Law, who's the leader of the Conservative Party, who is hitching his mast to the unionist sail, um, he turns around to Edward Carson and, and asks him to reassure the Southern Irish Unionists that they're not going to be abandoned. abandoned. And Carson says, what is there I can say? Uh, so, you know, th- th- they're coming to a recognition that if they're going to be successful in their mission as Unionists, they're actually going to have to rethink the idea of keeping the whole island. And they're actually going to have to start concentrating on the part of the country where they're most numerous. And of course, that then brings you back to all of the very long centuries of history that you're talking about. Why were they so um, dominant in that part uh, of the country. And that's what takes you back, of course, to the social engineering of the, the 16th and the 17th centuries. The, um, yeah, that, so you have this compromise situation that nobody's entirely satisfied with, to say the least. And I wonder if this is why, I think especially internationally, the border is often viewed as, in a negative sense people right across the world, they might know very little about Ireland. They might even really fully understand Irish independence, but they have the sense of Ireland's got a border in it, and this is a kind of an injustice. Why, why does the story never get sold that of it being a good thing? Because there are a substantial uh, minority of people who, to whom the border uh, is almost sacred. And, uh, it's, and from their point of view, it's, it's a story of a last minute's... Uh, saviour coming in. Phew, the border gets in just in time. But that story doesn't seem to get exported or it doesn't have much traction. Why do you think that might be? That's because the notion of it as sacred uh, or the notice, the notion of it as a very positive thing uh, is a profoundly uh, political assertion uh, from unionists um, in the sense that they saw this as the safeguarding of, of the integrity of the United Kingdom and of the British Empire, of which they were a part Uh, at the time that the border uh, was created. But if you put it in a wider context, it's actually part of a very broad-based tragedy. Uh, What do I mean by this? And I'm not making a political point uh, when I say this. I'm talking about what's involved in the artificial division of such a small island. Um, And if you consider now, you'll probably be uh, familiar um, with 
the, the work of uh, Kafka Kasabova when she writes about, you know, European yes. borders. She's writing as a Bulgarian and she's talking about the breakup of the Ottoman Empire and the contest for boundaries and disputed boundaries around that time, arising out of the huge convulsions of the First World War. We're part on this island of that uh, wider story as well. We have an Irish manifestation of what are international boundary disputes that are very common uh, with the decline of empires and, and the aftermath of the First World War. But she made the point that the reason why borders are seen as so, as, as so negative and seen as an injustice is because there's a very strong sense of a solution being imposed on the periphery from the centre and that this is done with impunity. Uh, in this case, you could argue from London, you know, um, that they pat themselves on the back for having come up uh, with this solution. It's embraced uh, by some people on the island. Uh, it's rejected uh, by others. It actually creates new minority problems. Um, but the reason why it, it, it is seen in such negative terms is because it's about a carve up and it's, it, it's a settlement which leads to such um, discord uh, and that that's a European problem. If you think of, of Greece and, and, and Turkey and, and Bulgaria, uh, when Kasabo was writing about that, again, there's great human tragedies and, and, and divisions at the heart of it. So, yes, one person's freedom or one person's sacred uh, protection of, of their rights is another person's captivity. Uh, it's very hard to fashion a positive narrative uh, out of that that isn't um, polemical uh, and, and, and extremely um, one sided. Um, one of the interesting things that happens in London over the course of the treaty negotiations, you know, the year after uh, partition becomes a reality, one of the interesting things that happens are that the private exchanges between senior British politicians, many of whom identified as unionists, who were prepared to acknowledge privately that the division of Ireland is a great tragedy for practical reasons, whilst publicly, of course, uh, they will adhere to the pre-sanctified dogma about the importance of the integrity of the United Kingdom. And I think that gulf between a private uh, acknowledgement uh, of what a tragedy, tragedy it is to divide an island for practical reasons, uh, the gulf between that and, and, and the public rhetoric is there throughout the decades. And it's there right up to the present day. Um, you know, we're all consumed at the moment with um, this virus, this COVID virus, mm -hmm. the border has become very relevant to that on this island. You know, how many times have we heard that a virus doesn't respect borders? Because it obviously doesn't. Uh, infectious diseases don't respect these uh, physical boundaries. And yet we have a situation on the island where we can't meaningfully um, get ahead of that virus when we have two different approaches to it uh, on the two parts of the island. So in practical terms, that actually goes back right back to what the British Prime Minister at the time of partition, David Lloyd George, said uh, to uh, unionists, you're cutting off the normal circuits of activity. And he was talking about trade, but there are other practical dimensions to you know, the, the natural circuits uh, that are affected by partition as well. Yeah, I mean, that's fascinating. You can see why somebody might say it's a little unfair to say talking to the border positively is political, whereas talking about it negatively isn't. Although I, I definitely take your point about the wider context. And you're right, of course, that uh, even for people who would vote to maintain it, it's very little, uh, there's, there isn't much love for the place in that sense. It's a kind of a necessary uh, defense, I suppose. But also in your book, you talk about, very interestingly about a partitionist mindset in the South, which you chart quite closely throughout the 20th century. Is this something that actually contributed, do you think, to the creation of the border, or is it something that sort of cohered after 1922? Oh, it's definitely there before the creation of the border. I mean, let's not fool ourselves. And remember, I wrote this book as somebody who grew up in Dublin. Mm. Um, you know, I was not somebody, as was so common uh, with my generation, I was not someone who uh, went over the border very often. I would have spent more time in London as a young man than I would have 100 miles up the road uh, over the border. That was very common uh, amongst my generation. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think that was within us from a very early stage, that sense of, of everything over the border being different, almost being alien, almost being abstract. Um, and there's certainly a distance there. But when I began to trace that mentality, um, it brought me right back. You know, I think it's the Achilles heel of an awful lot of, of the early 20th century generation of nationalists because they write and speak um, about this in almost mystical terms. You know, I mean, this is the, uh, the notion that Ireland um, is 
um, a sacred unified territory that cannot be divided. Um, they write about it almost in the abstract, but there doesn't seem to be much understanding of the mentality uh, of those who live in Ulster. And of course, mm. Ulster is a province, you know, Ulster is not the six counties um, that the Northern Ireland became. Um, but, you know, there are quite a number of characters from Ulster who become involved in, in, in politics, in Republican politics, very committed nationalists and Republicans who can recognize this as well. It's no coincidence, for example, that some of the most trenchant critics of successive governments of the Republic's policy towards partition are Ulster men. People mm. like Sean McEntee, who's a Belfast Catholic, and, and Ernest Blythe, um, you know, they can hone their criticisms born of their uh, Ulster background and their Ulster experiences. And they were very conscious of the failings of their generation of revolutionaries for making no efforts to understand the unionist mindset, um, or indeed the Ulster mindset. You know, that sense um, that they already think of Ulster as the other, um, mm. that it has a different uh, character. Um, that it is, in, in, in some respects, a, a separate entity. Um, and they're called to account, I think, for that. And they can't really come up with any answers. Um, and, you know, th there's a very long list of people who are guilty uh, of thinking like that. And, you know, it endured. I mean, I was reading Mary McAleese's autobiography there in recent times, uh, and she makes much of that as, as somebody who came down from Belfast to Dublin to work, say, in RTE, mm. uh, castigates the complete failure to either understand the reality uh, of Northern Ireland in the 1960s or the 1970s or make any attempt to educate themselves about it. Um, and even more recently, I remember when Mark Durkin, now, uh, the former SDLP leader, stood for Fine Gael uh, in the European elections. Um, and he got very irritated at what he regarded as, as this questioning of the appropriateness of him coming down here uh, to stand in our uh, constituencies and he used the word borderist these are borderist these attitudes you know so it has manifested itself in various ways uh from 100 years ago right up to uh, much more recent times um and i would still ask students guard as you know a, a very important exercise at the start of a class to do with this period how many of you have been in northern ireland mm. how many of you have been over the border uh, and there are more now than there would have been uh, 15 or 20 years ago um, but still a surprising number have absolutely no experience uh, of Northern Ireland. So it has endured. I wonder, uh, you're talking about this uh, failure to engage with uh, Ulster identity. And I wonder, going right back to uh, the, the discussions that led to partition, Arthur Griffith and his pa panel in London. I wonder, uh, it's interesting that they were speaking to English people about Northern Ireland in London. If they were actually across the table from Edward Carson and other Ulster Unionists, would that have panned out differently? I mean, <laughs> well, if, if only because they would have had a, a... They probably wouldn't have been subjected to such a charm offensive, at least. Well, I mean, James Craig did eventually meet uh, both Eamon de Valera and Michael Collins, mm. you know, and he found Michael Collins much easier to deal with. Most people found Michael Collins easier to deal with than de Valera. Um, uh, because De Valera tended to give abstract history lessons when he was talking to unionists. And James Craig, you know, this did his head in, uh, whereas he found uh, Michael Collins was more practical, you know, and they, they came mm. up with this kind of pact in 1922 uh, to try and take the heat out of uh, what really was a horrendous year. I mean, there were really 300 people killed in, in, mm. in 1922. The birth is, of Northern Ireland is, is so bloody. Um, but when, when you talk about, uh, you know, Irish nationalists speaking to English uh, politicians about it, um, what strikes me as, as perhaps equally revealing um, as their lack of dialogue with unionists uh, is the barely concealed antipathy uh, that London has for Northern Ireland and for unionists, you know. And David Lloyd George was great for speaking very frankly, according to his secretary, Tom Jones. You see, Tom Jones, David Lloyd George's secretary, thankfully for us, left his diaries behind and he recorded uh, these exchanges in minute detail. Now, they're not gospel, you know, and we have to account for a degree of embellishment. But there's a consistent theme there is that these bloody Ulster folk are such a nuisance. Uh, and the way David Lloyd George put it, you know, they're a pugnacious people, you know. Mm. Uh, and he said, you know, we're, we're not with them. Oh, we're only with them to the extent that we don't want civil war on our door. Uh, we don't love them. You know, there's no uh, great embrace or empathy uh, there and I think that's one of the reasons why such a strong sense of of, of uh, an Ulster unionist identity 
uh, develops because they certainly don't trust Dublin, but they don't trust London either. Mm. Uh, and again, that is, has endured. And there are reasons for that. And even at a much later stage, you know, when sworn enemies come together, like Ian Paisley and Martin McGuinness, what they can both agree on, I think, is that it's better for us to take as much control of Ulster uh, as we can, because we don't trust London uh, to do it. Um, so, you know, they can, over the course of, of, of time, come to uh, an accommodation about that. But yeah, it is, it, you know, to go back to your point, it is remarkable when you consider the, uh, the lack of dialogue. But there's also a sense, particularly with James Craig, as he takes over from Carson and Ronan Fanning, the historian, used this phrase, him sitting on Ulster like a rock. And I'm not talking to anyone about it. You mm. know, and we're not going, uh, we're not going to engage uh, in dialogue. And then later, when partition becomes more entrenched, you also have the question of the territorial claim that exists in the Irish Constitution uh, over Northern Ireland, which is like a red flag to a unionist bull. Uh, so they're certainly not going to engage in any kind of dialogue. And that takes time. I mean, it's a Cold War and there's a thaw eventually in the late 1950s and into the 1960s before it's interrupted again by the Troubles, you know. But there was a sense that, OK, let's look at practical stuff. Can we look at tourism or waterways mm. or, or non-contentious uh, issues. But the other interesting thing, which I think is always neglected, this is not just about unionists in the new Northern Ireland. It's also about those who are left in Cavan and Monaghan and Donegal, who consider themselves to be unionists, mostly Protestant. Uh, there's 70,000 Protestants uh, in those three counties on the wrong side of the border. So you have the one third Catholic minority, uh, a nationalist minority, obviously, in, in, in Northern Ireland, who don't feel uh, they're part of this state. But there's also that other minority question on the other side, uh, of the border uh, and they have to accommodate themselves to a new dispensation as well which is difficult would you agree they uh the national de delegation in the lead up to uh irish independence and partition they seemed outmaneuvered oh well, there's no doubt about that yeah i mean arthur mm. griffith in particular we have to remember i suppose like arthur griffith uh rep and, and michael collins together represented um you know different strands uh, of the Irish nationalist movement. I mean, Arthur Giffen was not a Republican. He never claimed uh, to be a Republican uh, in the sense that some of his colleagues were. You know, I mean, his original political manifesto was based on the idea of Ireland staying uh, as a united entity within the empire, the so-called dual monarchy. Um, he's seen as a moderate. And what they do is they isolate him. And this is a classic negotiating strategy. You look for what they regarded as the weakest link. Um, and it's not that Arthur Griffith didn't have considerable heft uh, and ability, and he was quite a, a, a brilliant uh, man in all sorts of ways and, and a great journalist. But they realised that perhaps he was not one of the diehards. Uh, mm. and that was always the description that was used about some of his colleagues. So they get him to agree to things. David Lloyd George in particular uh, takes advantage of this. He gets him to agree to things in kind of little side meetings, which is another negotiating tactic. And then he kind of impales him on the cross um, and he he's vulnerable. But you know, the big uh, naivety, I suppose, of Arthur Griffith is that he accepts the idea of a boundary commission, that this border will be reviewed because they're trying to get over the hump of yes. partition, which is already reality. So they say, we'll kick it to touch, we'll get it reviewed uh, in a couple of years by a boundary commission. And Arthur Griffith translates a boundary commission uh, into a plebiscite, and it's nothing of the sort. Um, and it wasn't that people were going to be voting directly on whether they wanted to stay um, in the new Northern Ireland or not. Um, and, you know, Griffith perhaps knew deep down um, that that wasn't a reality. But yeah, he is outmaneuvered and there is an experience and they were facing what you would describe as a very heavyweight uh, British negotiating team, of course, including famously Winston Churchill. Yes. Uh, and it's not that there wasn't cleverness on the Irish side and, and, and considered insights. There was, uh, <coughs> but they were outmaneuvered. And you know what the biggest failure they made, Gareth? They didn't have a bottom line. You don't go into negotiations without a bottom line. Mm. And the problem was, there were two sets of negotiators. There were those who were in London, in Downing Street, and there were those who stayed at home, most famously De Valera, who were sniping uh, from Dublin and who were sending instructions from Dublin, sometimes too late in the day. So they're not coherent. Yeah, it seems yes, quite a messy process. But I wonder, yes, we, we can imagine intransigent unionism and we can imagine sort of duplicitous uh, politicians in London. But isn't there something inherent perhaps in these men as well? that sometimes it looks to me like a simple kind of lack of imagination that they can't conceive of the partition of Ireland and therefore it sort of slips by them. I think that is a really interesting point and it's a really interesting point 
uh, in relation to the create not just the creative uh, uh, imagination, but bridging the gulf between their writings, their mm-hmm. thoughts, and the practicalities of negotiation and of compromise. Yes. They're not ready for compromise. They're not ready for thinking creatively uh, about compromise. De Valera, in, in particular, has a great blind spot about this because his attitude throughout is that Britain imposed it and the only way it can be undone is if Britain uh, mm. decides to undo it. Like, that's a huge failure of imagination, you know. Now, not everyone is like that, um, but there is... I was talking about that in the 1940s. He's still on that. He's still on that. No, I mean, he never loses it. I mean, eventually in private, we know in the late 1950s, uh, before he left, because I think he was very conscious that he'd never succeeded in one of his main political aims, which is to end partition. He does mm. talk about the prospect of Ireland um, rejoining the Commonwealth, uh, you know, a, a united Ireland rejoining the Commonwealth, that there is a compromise he's prepared uh, to make. But I mean, that's you know, it, it, it's far too late in the day. Uh, but you're absolutely right. I mean, there is that failure. I mean, these people have been reared often on a diet um, that of, of um, the mythical unity and i say mythical unity because uh, they gloss over an awful lot of of the uh the fissures and the differences and the complexities that were always there own mcneil does this as well as a historian you know when he goes right back and constructs a narrative of the history of ireland that doesn't acknowledge again uh you know the 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 deep divisions and complexities that are that are inherent uh in ireland as an entity anyway so when it comes to translating um, you know, their, their writings, their history and, and what they've been taught uh, into practical politics, you know, they fall at that hurdle. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But you could argue unionists do likewise in the sense that they have their own version of history, yeah. um, which is distorted and which is polemical and which serves a particular purpose around rallying, uh, rallying their supporters in the face of a threat. It's very reactive. It's very defensive. Um, and they have much that's distinctive and arguably they have much to celebrate in terms of their own identity. But that, too, can get lost when it's all thrown into the pot. Um, mm. It's very interesting, you know, in the in the years between the failure of the first Home Rule Bills in the 1880s and the 1890s and then up to the third Home Rule Bill, there's actually quite a lot of infighting within unionism. There are class tensions, there are farmer unionists, there are working class unionists. Um, and it's a reminder that unionism is not monolithic. Unionism has never been monolithic. Um, and whilst they campaign and rally around the idea of one voice, um, you know, that was never uh, truly reflective of, of the unionist family. You kind of this word uh, going forward in time a little, but you sort of came close to the subject there. So I'll take it up now. Um, so, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, there's, it took a long time through the 20th century for for sort of the Irish political imagination to think we need to start uh, actually engaging with Ulster unionism, these, these people. Um, but lately now with the Brexit debate, uh, there's a phrase that's gained a lot of traction, and I'm not sure where it came from, but it's the idea that it's not Ireland's border, it's Britain's border in Ireland. And uh, I think it might originate with Darrow O'Brien, the comedian who, uh, who uh, threw it out on television. That, but that seems to me that's flashing back to, that, to the 1930s, isn't it? it well, it, it, it certainly didn't begin with Darrow O'Brien. <laughs> and, I, I just mean, mean, I just mean as a kind of a phrase that was I know, I know around, yeah. and I mean Darrow Breen. You know, Darrow Breen is a contemporary of mine and uh, from Bray, and you know, again would have grown up in in, in the south uh, during the year of the troubles, um, and you know, uh, I don't imagine he spent much time over the border either. Um, but it's but a very interesting the sentiment. The sentiment uh, is that we're not responsible for the border; it's people in England. Oh, well, this is the point, you see, that um, if you call uh, the border, the Irish border um, or the British border, um, you're going to get into trouble uh, either way um, for for very obvious reasons. Um, Isn't the border a creation of both Britain and Ireland? Uh, Couldn't you argue that the um, demand for a border is a product of the failure um, of Irish people to agree? Mm. Um, and that it has to be seen not just as a British creation, but something that was born with the assistance of Irish midwives as well. Um, so I don't think um, it can be referred to either as exclusively a British border or an Irish border. Of course, you can argue that this was a British imposed uh, solution, um, but it's also something that was accepted 
um, by um, unionists uh, in Ireland. Um, and it was, you know, something that was um, a product of, of those upheavals of that decade where Irish people could, could not agree. Um, and there was a fundamental question asked when the, the, the partition debate began in the House of Commons in Westminster by Harry Lawson, who was a British Liberal MP with unionist sympathies. And he asked this basic question, how are you in this age, in this democratic age, how are you to force a million people, uh, a, a million unionists into a system they don't want to be part of? Um, how are you to turf that minority uh, out of the United Kingdom? And that was the question, and that was the challenge. Um, and there was a failure in Ireland to come up with a solution uh, to that. Um, mm. And Britain, by 1920, regards it as imperative that they have to get a solution because it's the only way they can deal with our wider Irish problem. Um, so, yes, it's Walter Long, primarily, uh, who was a former leader of the uh, Unionist Party, who drafts what becomes the Government of Ireland uh, bill that, that, that partitions Ireland. But who did he talk to, first and foremost? James Craig. He wasn't talking to Irish nationalists. He's talking to the British government. He's talking to James Craig. So in that sense, I can see the argument uh, about the way in which this was created and, and, and foisted uh, on certain people. Um, but James Craig then referred to it as the ultimate sacrifice because they were cutting off their southern brethren. Uh, now, you can take that with a pinch of salt when you consider what he got, the rock that he got to sit on. Uh, but I don't think either label British or Irish border is, is at all satisfactory. Um, on their own, you know. But well, I get the sense for the last hundred years, anyway, the government in London would have accepted any solution that Ireland, North and South came to. And get it off our table. Yeah, exactly. You don't want so that, means, that means it's Ireland's border. I, I mean, it, like, no, that me, probably means the solution um, to our to, to the border in Ireland has to be an Irish solution. Uh, that's I guess for me. When you think of a that's border, for me the invention. interesting thing. Sorry, I guess it maybe depends if you think of a border as an invention that, that is placed somewhere and there it stays, like a sculpture. Or if you think of it as a lived continuum. And I guess I'm more the latter. And perhaps it's different in the 1920s, but now it's Ireland's border. Uh, no, I take that point. That's a very good point, actually. And I do see it uh, as a continuum. I don't see it um, as a historical artefact uh, mm. you know, that's cemented. Um, and, and we know that. Uh, how often have we we spoken in recent years about an invisible border, you know? Um, and there was a time when the border was anything but uh, invisible. So, no, I accept that point. I mean, the interesting thing uh, about the private exchanges, again, um, you know, some of the most senior British officials, including people who ran uh, the Treasury, people like Warren Fisher, they used to refer to the border as artificial, absurd and ridiculous. Um, and... They went as far as to say, if we could get rid of it in the morning, we would. And why wouldn't they? It's always been a nuisance. It's always come back to bite them. You know, David Lloyd George famously boasted that he had conjured the Irish question out of existence. Well, he had in his backside, you know. Um, he put he put the problem into cold storage. And, of course, it came back um, and continues to come back to haunt um, the British prime ministers, uh, as we know from recent events. So, you know, they're... They were prepared to make private admi ad admissions that this was something they didn't want. They wanted it off their table. It's very expensive um, and it causes nothing but trouble and it destabilizes uh, English politics. And that's the flip side. You see, it has been useful in English politics and it was useful in recent years arising out of Brexit uh, because it was a pawn. Mm. And the Irish question and the border were again becoming a pawn in what was a distinctly English power game. It's very mm. ironic, you could say, that the DUP were... Uh, aligning themselves with arch Tory nationalists uh, who were much more concerned about Brexit than they were about Northern Ireland remaining a part of the UK. And we know that through polling of the, the, the Tory party as well. So it, there were times when it was useful, but it also had the capacity to become what was termed by Chamberlain a fatal influence on British politics. And they didn't want that. Uh, and what Irish nationalists and Republicans used to do in turn and was to say that if you give us a declaration, if Britain gives us a declaration that they won't stand in the way uh, of Irish unity, well, then we can sort out this problem yeah. ourselves. You know? uh, but that, of course, suggested that they were going to be able to create uh, the circumstances and a dialogue that would actually bring an end to the border. And there was never any evidence or sign of that. I want to ask you a couple of what if questions. Some people watching this will know you, you used to do a program for RT Radio called What If, when you imagined different... Uh, 
with sort of counterfactual histories and what would result is a brilliant program. And maybe you covered some of these in your episode, so I apologize if this is familiar uh, terrain for you. We've got one from somebody who's attending, the name's not up, but he's, he's posted a question in Q&A, and he's wondering what would have happened if Northern Ireland had been four counties, which at one point was, was the imagined uh, arrangement, so the, the northeast corner. Would the, where would we be now if that had occurred? Four counties was the option that they were looking at, you know, mm. uh, and the idea of a four county Northern Ireland uh, w- was considered for quite some time. I think it would have been too small to be feasible. Um, you know, when you're wondering what would have happened, um, I think that probably would have worked to the advantage of those who wanted uh, to get rid of the border altogether of four county uh, Northern Ireland. If you think about it as an entity, what it would have represented, what would have been viable for it uh, in political and economic terms, um, you know, I can't imagine it would have survived. Um, it would have just been too small. One of the reasons, of course, why uh, there's That's an embrace. That's what people said about six counties, didn't they? They it's did, yeah, but not to the same extent as four counties, you know. I mean, there's a substantial difference, you know. Mm. Um, you know, the population of the new Northern Ireland in, in, in 1921 was 1.25 million. Um, you know, if you had been looking at something that was well uh, short of that, um, it might have been different. It's not just about, I appreciate, it's not just about um, population figures. But I do think, um, you know, given already what we know about the six counties and how Arguably, you could argue that the economy is very artificial uh, and is hugely reliant on subvention um, and public sector in, in employment. Um, I think some of the economic difficulties would have been even more magnified by uh, a four county. Okay. I have another one for you. 1893, the, the Lords does not have a veto over the House of Commons. And the second Home Rule Bill is passed. Where would we be now? Uh, we'd probably still be in the same position, um, <laughs> unless so uh, 1893. You know, 1893. Um, that decade, there's a sense that nationalism has lost its its oomph and its its verve. Parnell is gone. The downfall of Parnell creates a very difficult legacy for Irish nationalists. They don't really reunite until 1900 under the leadership of of, of John Redmond. They're certainly not in a position to be. Um, aggressively pursuing, um, you know, the, their nationalist aims. Um, so, you know, th- th- that 1890s, you know, if if, if Home Rule had had, had succeeded uh, in the 1890s, there still would have been uh, an opportunity for for Unionists to build a ferocious alliance against uh, and and argue and, and possibly to take up arms um, against uh, this particular um, dispensation. Uh, so I think there would have been a great degree of destabilization that could have endured um, so that instead of uh, a lot of nationalists, as they did, you know, turning their attention to kind of cultural pursuits and, and cultural nationalism, um, they may well have found themselves trying to uh, deal with the onslaught of, of, of a very substantial unionist resistance, not just um, in, you know, in, in what would have been the new Northern Ireland then, um, but also in, in, in Southern Ireland. Yes, well, yes, well, it wouldn't have been uh, quarantined, as one person put it, that you quote in your book in the Northeast. Well, um, you see, that was, yeah, yeah. But this kind of gets back to my original point, doesn't it? So you can imagine these what of scenarios, but they seem to resolve back around to bloodshed, at least, if not partition. Well, so I mean, one, another what if, of course, which. Uh, is worth contemplating is what would have happened if, if the third Home Rule Bill uh, had been implemented after the First World War. It's postponed for the duration of the war. Nobody knows mm-hmm. in 1914 how long that's going to last and so much changes in the meantime. But if it had been imposed, um, the likelihood is there would have been civil war uh, in Ireland. Um, and as you know, <laughs> there was civil war in Ireland. There were two civil wars in Ireland uh, mm-hmm. because you could argue, and I would argue that there was a civil war in the new Northern Ireland. Um, mm. In the early 1920s, there's also one, of course, in 1922 to three um, in Southern Ireland. But there could have been a civil war at an earlier stage if Home Rule had been imposed against the will um, uh, of Unionists as a as a result of the Third Home Rule Ho- Home Rule Bill. If that had become a reality, it's very difficult to see um, how there would have been um, a peaceful uh, protest as opposed to violent protest. Let's not forget that uh, many people regarded. Um, Ireland is on the brink 
of serious bloodshed uh, before the First World War in 1913, where you had both the Ulster Volunteer Force and the Irish Volunteers um, as, as paramilitary groups. Uh, they weren't particularly well armed, but they were armed. Um, and, you know, they meant business. So what can we learn from this? This is a big question. What can we learn? If, because right now in other nations across the world, polemics or, or uh, polarized groups are starting to take shape. Um, at, what, at what point do, we, do you have to ring an alarm bell and say, we, we need to address this? Because I would tend to agree with you from any point from the mid 19th century on, it seemed there was, there was going to be violent conflict. And is there anything that can be learned from this? Well, I suppose one of the things that you can learn from recent times is that you can take the heat um, out of a border situation. Um, now, part of that, of course, has been a very long peace process um, that has not been without uh, its, its, its setbacks. Um, but even the physical manifestations of a border, um, I think there's a broad consensus uh, that the infrastructure around a border being dismantled is a positive thing, you know. Mm. And I mean, it struck me that even, you know, the most trenchant unionists uh, were very keen in the aftermath of Brexit to talk about how positive a free-flowing um, cross-border traffic is, you know. Um, and that, in, in again, going back to the point about practicalities, you know, this is a positive thing. Um, so, I mean, th that's one uh, uh, sign um, that, you know, not having targets, you know, a hard mm. border always attracts violence. You know, there's an infrastructure around it and there's a symbolism around the infrastructure of a border uh, that uh, provokes and generates uh, violent responses. Um, we certainly know that uh, from our history, as it does smuggling as well. I mean, some of the great border stories are smuggling stories. You know, I mean, there's always a boom there for some. Uh, when it comes to how you take advantage of such a porous border. I mean, it's extraordinary to think. Um, I do quote the one of the ordnance surveys from the 1930s um, where there were deemed to be 180 crossings to the border. But then when they had another look at it a couple of de decades later, as you'll know well from traversing it, they decided there were over 200 mm. uh, crossings and, um, you know, even what constitutes a, a border crossing. Um, so, you know, the terrain... Uh, I was very amused at, you know, Margaret Thatcher's take on this, that she wanted a border that didn't have all these kinks and wiggles as she described it, you know. Yeah, you know. So, you know, that's another one of the messages. Like, how feasible is it to control a border uh, that porous? Um, you know, we're well aware that they were never able to control the border. They were never able to manage uh, the border in a, in, in, in a practical way or even in terms of, of, of security. Um, so I think that's another one of the messages, that you allow a border sometimes to collapse uh, under the weight of its own messiness or perhaps its own contradictions. Mm. Um, that takes a long time um, and you can reach a certain settlement. Um, and I think people had reached a certain settlement. Um, there's also, I would think, um, a distinct way of thinking around the border and people who inhabit the border hinterland. Uh, they are a different people. Um, and I'm not talking about nationality. I'm, I, I, you know, I'm not talking about political affiliation. I suppose I'm talking more about uh, just being a product of a borderland. Um, you know, that is a distinct um, way of, of, of perhaps thinking uh, that is colored by your uh, experience of being on a frontier. Um, and again, the, the, the question is, how do those people come to terms with their uh, situation or their dispensation? Um, and if they're OK with it, um, you know, th that means it's that means something very different, you know, mm. um, if there's, there has been a degree of accommodation. And that's not just about politics and economics. It's also about sport and it's about culture. Uh, I was very struck by writers over the years like Tyrone Guthrie and Hubert Butler, who were making the case for, um, you know, dialogue across the border. Yes. Uh, arguing that a lot of these divisions uh, were, were political uh, and artificial mm. as opposed to being truly cultural you know and that there could be um uh, this sense of of of, of dialogue across the border uh, again taking the heat out um or lessening some of the contentious issues you know that brings me i mean that brings me back to the idea of the imagination and if i'd say if your story if, you, if your history of the border had it was thought of as a story had an arc then what you see is the gradual strengthening of Ireland's imagination and our sense of pluralism and what was possible. 
I, I, I asked you earlier about what limitations perhaps the original Irish delegation was suffering from. And I wonder if back those days, not just those men, but perhaps the West, Western imagination in general, rather fixated on symbolism as, as, as a source of identity. So if you read the original transcripts of the discussions, they're really fixated on having to swear an oath to the Queen. Yeah. And much less so than partition. And anyone reading yeah. it now goes, partition is much more significant. Yeah. And I wonder if during the 20th century, we went from seeing our identity hooked on symbols to get much more sense of a land as an identity or a map. Oh, yeah. yeah. And therefore, obviously, maps have their difficulties too, as, as including borders. But all the same, at least a land can potentially be more pluralistic and you can have lots of different you can have diversity in a country the way you can't have diversity with the idea of a royal leader or a pope or whatever you got mm, yeah so and, and that's that's sort of what i see in your story is this yeah. widening of the imagination from the original act of partition which seems like a big failure of imagination to the good friday agreement yeah which is a major imaginative leap I think you're right about that complete preoccupation, if not obsession, with symbols, but also with territory. You mm. know, one of the great shifts was to try and, and, and get people not so much to think, think about territory or symbols um, or emblems, but to think about people and to think about land, you know, and shared. I mean, even that whole idea of a shared island, you know, uh, we might say that's become cliched now. But, um, you know, it's remarkably important um, how you use language and how you characterize uh, an island uh, and, and what is contained within that island. Um, and obviously, I mean, that developed into a political narrative uh, for some um, in, in the sense of, of, of taking the focus away from territory and towards people, you know, and, you, you know, there was no point in talking about territory or flags or symbols if you couldn't bring the people together. And I could give the example of rugby. Haven't they managed it quite well? Mm. You know, not without uh, problems over the years. They had to come to accommodations uh, but, you know, rugby was organized on a provincial basis from the from the 1880s in Ireland mm. uh, and they were able to to retain that all island uh, team and that all island sense of, of an Irish rugby identity. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it didn't belong um, to one political side. Um, so that is an illustration that it could be done. It couldn't be done in soccer. Mm. They didn't manage it in soccer. You know, we often heard ourselves saying that, uh, particularly when. Um, Irish soccer's fortunes um, revived you know what would an all-island soccer team be like you know uh, and again that would never uh, have been about you know land and territory that was about soccer players mm. <laughs> that was about you know bringing the best um, of the land uh, in, in into a, a one team you know um, so certainly there's no doubt about that I mean there has um, been very interesting shifts over the years even uh, looking at the archive of Sean Lamas, for example, he became Taoiseach and, you know, he told his cabinet um, on the first week he became Taoiseach. He said, gentlemen, there will always be a Northern Ireland. Uh, what are we going to call it? Because they were still calling it the six counties mm. um, and that offended many. Um, and there are still people today who will call it the six counties. Um, and, you know, they're not going to change um, the terminology that they use. But Lamas was making the point that we can actually think and speak differently. Um, about what we feel deeply about uh, with a view to actually trying to create uh, more of a, uh, of a sense of, of an island that we can work together with. And he wasn't talking uh, about the, um, the ending of partition. He wasn't talking uh, in De Valera terms yeah. uh, about putting pressure on Britain um, uh, to undo the damage. He was just talking uh, uh, about talking um, and about perhaps avoiding uh, the use of, of language that was clearly offensive uh, for, for, for certain people on the island. Um, and OK, you can say that's obvious to us now. That involved somersaults in the late 1950s. Yes, and to the extent it's, it's quite strange to look back at it. It seems like under-evolved. Um, I want to ask you one question that we got from a participant here, Anne Loveday. Uh, maybe you don't know, but I'm very interested in this myself. Uh, she's uh, she's educated in England, and she's wondering now what Irish Irish schools teach about the history of the period. About mm. the history of this period? Yes, yeah, some partition. They teach a lot. Um, I'm very pleased to see that on the Leaven Star curriculum, there's a, um, 
particular attention given to partition. There's a section on partition. Mm. Um, and, you know, a lot of the stuff that the Tower um, Museum are covering in terms of its origins, its impact and its legacy. Um, so it's not shied away, away from in a way that it was. Uh, and mm. the amount of older people who have told me, you know, our history deliberately stopped in 1916, because the things that came afterwards were too painful to contemplate. Well, that's know? my recollection <laughs> as well from the, I yeah. guess, from the early 90s, loads yeah. of 19th century. Yeah. I mean, there was also mm. a, a, a deliberate determination um, to perhaps end um, before the partition of Ireland and before the Civil War, um, that they wanted mm. to, to, to end on a glorious note uh, with the War of Independence. Uh, but even they couldn't do that because the glorious note, of course, uh, also includes the partition of Ireland. Mm. Um, so it's not the vindication of, of the ambitions that they set themselves and the dreams that they were hoping to realise. Um, but yes, partition is dealt with very seriously in the curriculum now. Um, and I was also struck, of course, by um, the amount of people who told me who had been educated in Northern Ireland that they didn't learn enough um, mm. about uh, the, the history of the Republic, you know. Yeah. Uh, which again, um, when you think about it on a sh on a small island, uh, is a terrible failing. Yeah. Well, my sons here in Belfast go to an integrated school, so uh, mixed. But still, it is it's a, it is a more of a UK curriculum, and so I, I find that a little frustrating because. Uh, well, you have to remind yourself as well, Gardner. You'll know this when you're talking about a UK curriculum. You know. Um, Britain always looms, you know, uh, much larger in the Irish consciousness than Ireland does in the British consciousness, you know, and uh, we have to constantly remind ourselves of that. You know, when people ask me why, uh, for example, the border wasn't discussed in any serious way during the Brexit referendum campaign, I said, because they don't care and they're not interested and they're not educated about it. You know, one of the reasons I was determined to write the border book, I suppose, was, was after Brexit because I was just so... Um, angry in many ways that there had been such a, an ignorance and dismissal of the complications uh, of the border as if all of these issues had been settled and it, it couldn't possibly uh, be worth considering you know uh, so we do have to remind ourselves sometimes of, of, of the way in which uh, their education uh, doesn't factor in uh, Ireland to the extent that you know certainly in, in the Republic uh, we would factor in uh, a, a consideration of, of the consequences of, of British policy. You know, one of the first courses I studied um, in UCD when I was an undergraduate over 30 years ago was the Irish policy of the British government. Um, and Ronan Fanning used to teach that course, used to constantly refer to the perennial difficulty of commanding British attention. You know, <laughs> when are you actually going to take this country seriously and, and, and try and come up with, uh, you know, solutions to the problems? Well, only when we have our bigger fish fried. Well, I, I was interested there reading your book and perhaps Michael Lappin's there recently again, that uh, there was an interesting parallel recently when the DUP held the balance of power in Westminster. Well, that's what happened with the Irish Parliamentary Party. And that really helps them get the Home Rule Bill through. Similarly, oh, absolutely. I mean, the Liberal Nationalist Alliance, and it's on a much bigger scale than the DUP, mm. um, you know, they were able to prop up a government uh, with um, a relatively small group. I mean... Well, at the height of well. at the height of their power, the the Irish Parliamentary Party held eighty six seats um, in in Westminster, and they they held the balance of power. Um, I was interested while well, reading your book. You mentioned that uh, Margaret Thatcher was leaned on a little to, uh, but from the United States to encourage her in the direction of the Anglo Irish Agreement. And another thing we're hearing about lately, another term that's flying around is the idea, from senior US politicians, is the idea that the USA is the guarantor of the Good Friday Agreement. To what extent is that true? <laughs> no, it's not true. I mean, you know, th this is not an agreement, a formal uh, agreement that incorporates uh, the United States of America, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, this is an agreement between uh, Belfast, Dublin and London. It gives the impression he signed something, but this is not the case. Well, no, I mean, that story actually begins, uh, I was reading Seamus Mallon's uh, book there um, not so long ago, and he was talking about the mood of despair within the SDLP after the collapse of, of Sunningdale and power sharing. And they'd nowhere to go and they were broke and they were really fed up. Um, and as he put it, the only place left for John Hume to go was America. So off he went and he got Jimmy Carter's administration in 1977 uh, to agree um, you know, that they would welcome a power sharing solution and that they would encourage uh, a coming together of the different sides. 
Um, and that was unprecedented, uh, that intervention. Mm. Um, and John Hume and his colleagues were, again, annoyed that it, not enough attention was, um, was given to that and that perhaps Dublin wasn't taking it seriously enough. Um, but then it, it was revisited, you know, because John Hume kept working uh, those connections. And then by the 1980s, early 1980s, when, when Reagan is in power, you know, there's a lot of behind the scenes maneuvering um, to, to, to try and get uh, the American administration at that most senior level to intervene, to lean on Maggie. Um, and of course, Margaret Thatcher, um, there were very few people who could lean on Margaret Thatcher. Uh, Ronald Reagan was one of them. Mm. Um, so th that was a very clever strategy um, uh, by the SGLP at that time. And of course, they got him uh, to lean on her. And she was open to it. I mean, she actually came uh, in her memoirs to decry the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty. She regarded it as, as a great mistake. Um, but she was open at the time. And again, it goes back to some of your earlier points. Why was she open to being uh, you know, somewhat more flexible than her persona and her rhetoric suggested? Again, get this complication away from us. You know, uh, I have other things to be worrying about. I mean, there's an extraordinary exchange after the signing of the Anglo-Irish Agreement when they're toasting it, herself and Gareth Fitzgerald, the Taoiseach, are toasting it with a glass of champagne. And he mentions the possibility of getting money from the International uh, Fund for Ireland, uh, for Northern Ireland. And she was disgusted. And she kind of waved her hand in the general direction of Northern Ireland. And she said, more money for those people. Look at their roads. Look at their schools. She said, I need that money from my people. Now, isn't that remarkably revealing? Mm. Uh, I need that money for my people. These are not my people. Yeah, and so where, how do you think that would pan out, though? Um, will this idea uh, of the United States as guarantor of the Good Friday Agreement, will that, is that something that you think will solidify and become a significant factor in the next few years? To be honest with you, I was looking at Mulvaney there, uh, who has arrived over as, uh, you know, as the envoy. Mm. And part of me was wondering, is that still a necessary part of the apparatus, of the diplomatic apparatus in relation to Northern Ireland? Um, now, you all always want to be very careful uh, not to tempt fate. You would like to think that there would be some semblance of an evolving or maturing politics that wouldn't involve uh, handholding by the United States anymore. Uh, there, there, there is a part of me that has wondered that in the last couple of years. You know, there's no doubt um, of, of the importance of the intervention. Um, you know, and when you consider uh, how the Good Friday negotiations or the Belfast Agreement negotiations were uh, were handled pretty adroitly, and American intervention was crucial there, um, you have to wonder, uh, more than twenty years on, um, what level, what level of American intervention uh, is needed. Um, I mean. Do you think Donald Trump is interested in Northern Ireland? Me? No, not particularly. Uh, you know, I, 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 I do wonder. Um, I think it's more likely to be, I think, I, I suspect it would be considered a bit of a Democrat possession. Yeah, and I, like, I've no doubt that they, they do take it seriously. And I mean, mm. you know, Nancy Pelosi has, has been very trenchant in asserting um, that they're going to make life very difficult when it comes to a possible post-Brexit trade agreement with the United States uh, if the border is upon or if there's any, you know, uh, compromising of, of, of the uh, agreement. And I mean, that, that sentiment is still very strong. Uh, it also causes a broader politics. negativity about Brexit, which Trump has spoken in favour of. So, yeah. I mean, it, it, one suspects that's really the, the thing they're after. That's the thing they're problematising, Brexit. Oh, there is, oh, absolutely. Yeah. But again, doesn't it illustrate as well how, you know, the Irish question can become useful. Mm. Um, for a variety of different strategies, you know, but it can also become a huge inconvenience. We've had a couple of people asking about the water boundary and the foil, the unsettled location of the border there. Have you any views on how that might play out? It's rather That's one thing I haven't question, yeah. perhaps, but. No, it's not something I've thought much about. I mean, it, it, it was an issue right from the start um, and it had to be adjudicated on. You know, how do you manage uh, the waterways? Um, and I mean, the creation of waterways, Ireland, uh, you know, was was regarded as a very practical and, and, and progressive step, um, again, to try and prevent uh, it, it, it becoming a contentious issue. You know, but I'm not quite sure um, how that fits into the current uh, the current scenario. Mm. Is there any sense when we when we think about Irish independence 
and the energy there, or perhaps the despair that l- led to those moves. Is there any sense that Brexit has has its similarities? Because there's no doubt that a lot of Brexiteers feel this is their revolution. And well, I mean, we... they talk about taking back control. You know, I mean, if you look at all the mantras that they're using, um, you can draw direct parallels uh, with a lot of nationalist movements, you know, not just the Irish one. The idea of taking back control, the idea that they are leaving a cruel empire, uh, in this case, you know, the Brussels bureaucracy, um, and the idea that they are going to be masters of their own destiny, which has always, of course, uh, been um, a key plank uh, of a nationalist agenda. I mean, I was talking earlier on today about the 100th anniversary of the hunger strike of um, Terence McSweeney, who died in Brixton Prison in 1920, in October 1920. Um, you know, and he was very much of that, um, of that ilk, you know, um, and there were huge advantages to him uh, in, in pitting himself as he saw it one emaciated individual against the might of the British Empire. And, you know, th- th- that, that, that became a very important um, emotional appeal as well. And there is a lot of emotion uh, bound mm. up with the, uh, the Brexit issue. I mean, I'm not remotely in favour of, of being completely dismissive um, of, of, of those who vote, um, voted in favour of Brexit. You know, there, there can be a huge snobbery sometimes uh, in, in, in dismissing uh, the, the level of sentiment and emotion uh, around that question, as well as the hard-headed uh, thinking uh, that someone would see, some of them would see as being central uh, to their thoughts about Brexit. Uh, you know, if you ask uh, fishermen, for example, in various parts of England why they voted in favour of Brexit, you know, they'd be able to tell you exactly what they think of the European fisheries policy, you know. Um, so, you know, it's not all just about bloody minded uh, Tory uh, nationalism, but at the same time, it is playing in um, uh, to a lot of those those basic sentiments that we associate, that we would have associated with a historic um, nationalism, perhaps, you know, uh, it does seem almost quaint uh, in some respects, but we also recognise, I suppose, the forces that it can uh, unleash. Mm. Um, and that's the other thing about nationalism, and that's not just about Ireland or Britain. You know, again, if you go back to where we started and the, the convulsions of that period that led up to a partition, I mean, there uh, was the ultimate manifestation uh, of, of the horrors of extreme nationalism um, and what can happen as well um, after the revolution. Um, sometimes civil wars can uh, be much more vicious than the wars of, of, of national liberation. We are back where we started. However, I'm going to say one more thing before we wrap up here. And thank you, everybody who's been contacting me. I think we didn't manage to touch on most of your points, but I, I apologize that we can't answer every question. I would actually, this is almost a, this is almost a creative question. I love the way in your book about the border, you close most chapters with a look at what art was doing during the phase you just discussed. Mostly writers, not just writers, photographers as well. Um, what's, what's behind that style of presenting an historic story? I can't write history without drawing on that pool. You know, mm-hmm. um, I've never been able to do it. And, and I'll tell you why. The archive, the documentary record can tell you what happened. It can't tell you what it felt like. Writers perform a hugely important function in relation to telling you what it felt like. It mightn't be their direct experience. Sometimes it is. Um, but it is for me about their ability to encapsulate a, a sense of what things feel like, you know. And you can have a very cold, austere type of of history writing um, that takes out that humanity. Um, and even in Queens, you know, I remember the great ATQ Stewart, who was a great historian of Ulster. Um, and he made that point in the early 1990s. Far too many historians are writing history with the humanity taken out. <laughs> you know, that, um, you know, history is about feelings. And too many people are writing history uh, without the feelings included. And I'd agree with him. Um, and I think that's the, the main reason why I do it. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. It was absolutely lovely to talk to you. And thank you for all the insights you gave me uh, on the border because you actually walked it, uh, yes. which I didn't. And that's a very important point. <laughs> There's a lot of fields, but it's a, it's a, it's a certain style of research, uh, uh, research. I wouldn't call myself an historian. I wouldn't really dare do that. But, but you uh, see, the border can't be you know, uh, the preserve of, of historians when it comes to writings about the border. That's the other thing. I mean, some of the most illuminating insights we've had on the border have been from people like you, have pe- been people who are actually walking it and feeling it and observing it. 
Um, you can get an awful lot of, of, of insight in a way that you'll never get from an archive when you approach it like that. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, things you've mentioned and I've returned to as well, the importance of the imagination and the emotional aspect of our relationship to the land are very intangible things. And that's what I really enjoyed about you, the, as you just explained, why, why you utilize the work of artists as well. And one gets a fuller sense of the story because we do tend to we do tend to conceive of things in frames and as narratives, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. And maybe this is a limitation. I think in a way, the original Irish delegation, I was talking about their lack of imagination. That was maybe they they, they thought it was going to end one way. And they couldn't get over the fact that actually yeah. the story had a different ending. Yeah. And it took no, I think you're absolutely right. 50s to accept that. Yeah. Um, so the story concept can limit you also. But all the same, this is, seems to be how our brains work and how we, how we understand the world. And so, yes, I think it's, it's, uh, it's an important thing to consider. And, and absolutely. Yeah. Work. And, and, and I think you do it beautifully in yours. So thank you very much. Um, Thank you all for joining us. Yes, we went from we went from 140 to 161, so we must have been doing something right. <laughs> um, okay, and thank you everybody who typed in your uh, your comments and questions. I'm going to have a look at them now. And uh, good night, Dermot. Good night. Lovely to talk to you, and thank you all very much. <laughs>